Today is April 30th. I uh, call the meeting of the Arlington School Committee to order. Uh, first item on the agenda will be uh, public participation. Uh, do we have a sign-in sheet over there? Um, we do. We do. But we don't have a secretary. We don't have a secretary today. Oh. Uh, you yes. will be playing the role of secretary. Oh, you ready? Okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, first, I want to introduce uh, uh, hmm? yeah, Clara paper. Stewart, who is a new uh, uh, student rep. She's a freshman. She went with us to Day on the Hill yesterday, so uh, okay. she's really gotten initiated. And Siobhan Foley, who disappeared for a minute, is Thanks. our AEA rep with us today. Uh, Kirstie Allison Ampey is homesick, so uh, she'll she's trying to get over the bug that's going around. Uh, Mariah Terrell from Thompson, first uh, person up. Uh, as I call people up, I remind uh, that the uh, public participation is a three-minute opportunity, and we traditionally do not comment on things that come before us in public participation. We will take them under advisement, and they may end up at, at an action item later in another meeting. So uh, Mariah, welcome. Great, thank you. Uh, just good evening, Dr. Bodie and members of the school committee. Uh, my name is Mariah Terrell. I currently have two students at Thompson, a second grader and a fourth grader. I have an incoming kindergartner and a two-year-old. So I'll have two other kids who are, who are coming into Thompson in the next couple of years. I just wanted to follow up. I emailed everybody a letter this past week. Um, and I just wanted to thank you for taking the time to read that. And for those of you that responded, uh, to me so quickly, I really appreciated that. Um, and I appreciated the thoughtful replies and some of the conversations I was able to have with you. Um, I'm here with a few other Thompson parents tonight just to reiterate our concern about equality among schools in regards to class sizes. Specifically, we're interested in seeing the class sizes in the older grades at Thompson be brought down in line with the other schools. Uh, currently, we have the highest number of students in our fourth and fifth grades by three or four kids per class. Um, I understand that you are well aware of the issues regarding the budget and physical limitations of the Thompson School, and we trust that you can come up with some other ways to make this happen and to support our teachers and students. I have already met with Karen Donato about this, and as you know, she's also concerned, and we're working with her on this issue as well. Um, I'm eager to hear your thoughts and potential, potential solutions and offer to assist if you find that brainstorming with parents is helpful. Uh, thank you again for your time and the effort you put into the excellence of our schools. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank Next you. Will be Jane Morgan. Hi, my name is Jane Morgan. I am a Stratton parent of a current second grader two kindergartners and I have a two-year-old at home, so I've got a long time uh, to be there and we've been really happy there. I know that you have heard from many of us over the last weeks about our concerns about the placement specifically for our current second graders during the relocation time um, when they can't be at Stratton. And we understand we're on the agenda for tonight. We're glad that that's being addressed. We're eager to begin some kind of dialogue with you so that we can find a and fund a placement for our kids that is at an elementary school during that year. Um, so I'm not gonna go into the details. We've gotten really great response from so many of you. I recognize that a lot of you are writing back to us late at night, early in the morning, at the weekend, um, and we really appreciate that. We, we feel like you know, we've gotten some, some great response and we've started working on this issue even before it's become an agenda item at school committee, so we're really grateful for that. Um, I just want to share one personal anecdote with you. I'm mindful of my time and yours, but um, I had a conversation with Principal Hannah after we knew that the kids were going to be relocated, um, but before we knew what their placement was. And he said, Jane, you know, you've got all these kids. Like, how is this going to be? And I was like, oh, it's going to be fine. Like, we are the kind of family. We're going to get it done. I know they're going to be at different schools. It's all going to be okay. You know, kids are resilient. It's going to be fine. My kids are going to get to be at an elementary school with other kids their own age. Maybe they'll play soccer with them. They're going to be 
at school with them. Eventually, maybe they'll do some kind of a project. Isn't that going to be great? They're going to know all these other kids, and we can be a part of that school for the year, and then we're going to come back to Stratton where we're so happy. Um, and I still feel that way about the experience my sons are going to have. I feel like that is how my kindergartners, who will be second graders, who at this point will be at Hardy, um, are going to have that experience, and it's going to be great. I don't feel like that is what is being offered presently to my second grade daughter, and that concerns me. And so we're really looking forward to working with all of you. We thank you for your attention to this so far, and uh, we're looking forward to uh, beginning the process of, of figuring this out. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Frank Siano. Good evening, honorable members. Um, I came, my name is Frank Siano, and thank you for uh, being here and doing what you do. I've come because uh, I'm a town meeting member from 15, and the parents have written me numerous emails about this Stratton relocation. And I see the face of our superintendent, and it's so good to see you be so concerned. They're unhappy with the idea of putting their fourth graders at the Audison. Now, I knew the Audison when it was the West. I went to the East. I graduated from this high school in 66 with, guess who? Norcross Stratton III. Mm -hmm. So he was, I believe, the grandson of what the school is named. So the only thing I ask you is to please keep in mind, listen to what they're saying. They want to be at an elementary school, please God. And, and if you need more money to do it, then, then ask for it. Because I think the town meeting last night was disposed to listen to the parents. So uh, I'm here for you. I ask that you listen to them and please make them be happy. Now granted, <clears throat> not everybody is happy about every decision that's made, but keep in mind their concerns, please. You, you know, they don't have PhDs. Many of the parents, maybe I speak out of turn and maybe they all do, but, but their parents and their mothers of children and they're worried. So Arlington has been famous for years for taking care of the parents and the children and I hope that you'll do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, at that point, this is the extent of our list. Is there anyone else for public participation? Hearing none, next item on the agenda is the fiscal 16 budget charts with uh, Ms. Johnson. Let me have that. <coughs> list. Good evening. Um. <coughs> Um, as part of the budget subcommittee, we've been trying to look at different ways of exploring the budget growth over years. You know, this is always a difficult question. You know, are, is it fair? Is it equitable? Are we doing what we ought? Should we be doing more? Should we be doing less? So I've um, been doing a little work. We did some work around the town manager 12, some of which you saw at town meeting last night. And uh, Superintendent Bodie will be talking about later tonight. But we did do a couple of graphs that we felt weren't quite ready for town meeting, but that the budget subcommittee felt would be important to share with all of you. Now, what you have here is actual budgets in green for the school department. This is all in, grants revolving the whole nine, the whole nine yards. The orange bars here represent what it would be if we took this 07 budget and just multiplied it by three and a half percent each year. So as you see, it's a perfectly straight extension. And you can see that in comparison to that, the rate of growth for the school department budget has exceeded that, that line, particularly since FY12, when we first started receiving 7% on our special ed portion of our town appropriation. And I know this is a matter of concern and discussion, and so we wanted to start thinking about some ways to look at it. So this is just the budgets, and you can see we are growing much faster than three and a half, particularly in the last couple of years. However, if you take those budgets and divide it by the number of students, we see a very different picture. Once again, I'm taking the 07 budget and multiplying it by three and a half percent. 
and dividing it by the students. No, I'm actually just multiplying it by 3.5%. I, I, I redact that. The green bars, I'm taking the actual budget and dividing it by the number of students in place at that time. So what you're seeing is despite the fact that our budget in you know, 12, 13, 14, in the last slide, is exceeding the 3.5% growth rate, which is generally considered the standard in the town of Arlington, when you divide it by the number of students we have on board, it's actually falling off that metric. Now, what does this mean? I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, and, and this, is, this is one of those things that, you know, I think, I think the discussion about the 3.5 maybe turning into 3, the 7%, and the 25% of per pupil for new student growth is something we need to look at. I think we need to look at it. You know, that, that maybe 25% per pupil is just not enough to keep pace because, as you see, we're, we're just not keeping pace when you consider the number of students we have. So, do you have any questions? Uh, Dr. Seuss. Uh, just a simple question. Uh, this number is lower than the per pupil spending. Is that because we're not including health care costs? There, there are two different metrics. Mm -hmm. This is not, is not per pupil spending. Per pupil spending is a calculation by the state that includes many factors and attempts to ca capture expenses on both the town and the school side. Right. This is not that. This is our school department our budget. budget divided by the number of students. Okay. So I, I want to be sure to draw that distinction because there'll be a lot of confusion if we try to mix those two things. Ms. Starks. So these do not have the 7 percent for special ed or the 25 percent to add it on, just the three No, and no, half. they, no, they, the, the orange bars do not. Okay. The green bars do include that. Okay, so it ha does. Ha so it has the three and a half, the seven, and the twenty-five percent. Oh, okay. Yes. It just and, and the, the title it, was just throwing me. It, it's it's quite it's more visible in this slide because you can see that you know we're really pacing up much faster than three and a half percent in you know from twelve onward. You can see that the green bars are exceeding the orange bars, but at the same whoops wrong way, but at the same time our enrollment growth has been so rapid that when you divide that growth by the number of students, we're actually rather shrinking in terms of budget per student. Mr. Thielman. So my question is, you know, the town manager has a 3.5% increase in the budget for this next fiscal year, FY16, for the schools, and then his proposal is that it go down to 3% or 3. 3.5. 3.5. 3.5. 3.5. 3.5. 3.5. 3.5. 3.5. 3.5. 3.5. 3.5. 3.5. 3.5. 3.5. 3.5. 3.5. 3.5. 3.5. 3.5. 3.
Mr. Hainer. Uh, one of the things that we, does this include grants and everything else? Yes. Okay. As I've mentioned several times, we have become dependent on grants. A one-time grant for a one-time thing I think is great. We should continue to go for those. Those grants like the kindergarten grant that we've become dependent on, it, as they go and as the town is decreasing our uh, amount of money, it's a factor. So in our thinking and our planning, and uh, I'd ask the board to ask the superintendent to find out all the grants that we are dependent on and we had part of our plan long range plan has to start us thinking about weaning away from those and, and getting it it adds another money factor but these grants in AEF and all these other wonderful people that have done great things for us as long as we're dependent on those they may dry up they may go away and we're going to be caught in a double shot fall with the town and everything the other thing I want to mention is that in the past we have had when uh, we got the kindergarten money and everything and originally I understood the agreement to do that but the town has been making X amount of dollars on us in each year and every time I bring it up I've been told we have an agreement with the town the town right now is looking at a fiscal crisis in the next four to five years and part of their plan is expressed in the past two meetings at the, the town meeting is everybody in the town pulling back I don't want to pull back we need to continue with our programs that, I, that exist and we need to expand some of these programs but at the same time we have this partnership so where I'm coming with this is the message that we send we have to sell this super hard we did a wonderful job thanks to Cindy and everyone else pushing for that extra 25 percent uh, the, the, dealing with the, our growth but we got to really be together and have one spe speech going forward uh, and it, I'm saying this because I think sometimes we get a little fractured. We, come, we, we get excited, we talk to parents and everything, and then sometimes we have to pull back on it. So I'd ask uh, my fellow members, working together, we have one speech go forward strong, the way we did with the 20, uh, to get that for our added growth. Thank you. Mr. Pierce. Yeah, I think that um, we need to go in with what we need and fight for it you know what is what is the amount of money that would be adequate for us to fund the schools for the next five years not a wish list because that could <laughs> that could totally throw everything off 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 uh, budget but what do we need and, and we should fight for it so in other words the 25 percent that we got for the enrollment growth factor was perhaps not what we should have been fighting for I mean any deal is better than than what we were at, but it was still probably too low for the numbers that we were looking at. So, and the long range plan is setting, setting us up for an override at some point. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think that we can, as a school department, look at an override in 2022 or 2023. I think it has to be done before that. That's already more than 10 years since the last override. Um, so, I, I, I think it would be great to have a presentation before the fall, you know, before the end of the school year, showing us what you project is our real needs over the next five years. Given the contract coming to a c close, we're going to finalize that with the teachers and the other the other union uh, subsets, but um, and and then go in and fight for that number, the, make the a case. The really tricky part in all of this is the enrollment variable. Mm -hmm. And we have my projections, but we are, as part of our um, space analysis, we're going to have an outside consultant doing a different type of enrollment projection analysis. And I think in order for that to be really powerful, I think we need that data. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I've done the long range projection based on, you know, potential settlements for the contracts and what I think the enrollment could be based on what it's been in the past. But this person is looking at it from a more comprehensive way. And I think once we get a better picture of what they're projecting for enrollment mm -hmm. growth, then we're in a position to say, look, you know, I'm projecting this, he's projecting this, mm -hmm. and if it's closer to that, here's what we're going to need. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, if we were a slow growing or flat district, mm -hmm. projecting your needs is a whole different ball game. But, you know, if we have 100 new kids next year or 400 new kids next year, that, it's enormously different in terms of what we need. And it's really hard to guess. Mm -hmm. It's been the problem all along. And the year's delay of the enrollment growth factor, while practical for all kinds of reasons, 
poses issues if we have a big surge in the summer because we basically have to pretty much suck it up in the first year and then we're paid in the out years. Mm -hmm. Right. Ms. Starks. Um, I think also the interesting thing is I got in touch with the uh, town manager's office and the <coughs> selectman's office and I requested the census data because the town does a census. It's not official. It's not like, you know, the, the, you know, the U.S. census. And I said, you know, I know you guys get census numbers because if you don't respond to the census, they can not allow you to vote. <laughs> um, and I said, so do you have those numbers? Can I have those numbers? And uh, the person that I was, you know, going back and forth with said, well, I'm not really sure how useful they are because mostly they're numbers of voters. They're not necessarily like the whole town voters. And I said, okay, well, just tell me this. We're seeing this huge influx of kids in the public schools. Is there a big influx of people in town? And their response was, no. We're pretty flat. So it's not that our town is growing, it's that our town is changing. And I yes. think that that's the problem, is that we don't, it, it, this, the change in, in students is not just because there's a population explosion in town, there's a population change in town. And that, I think, is why it's so hard to figure out what it is. If it was an explosion in people, everybody would be seeing it and, and everyone. And so I think that's part of the problem is that not that they don't believe us, but they're just like, well, where are they coming from? And I'm like, I don't know, but they, here they come, you know? And so I, it was just interesting that they could not in, in any way, shape or form, verif you know, say that they were seeing any kind of increase in numbers. They're like, no, actually we've been pretty consistently right around the same number, you know? We're not really seeing a huge growth in town. And I thought, wow, that's really interesting to me because I was trying, I was doing some of this as well, trying to think about like cost per student is that, you know, does it need to be related to, you know, population? But it's not. It doesn't, you know, the population itself hasn't grown. So I thought that was well, an let, me, let me pass your question on to either Ms. Johnson or the superintendent in that we do get the census and the children who are recorded in the census. And so if you could comment just briefly on what you're seeing through the census. Well, one, one of the things is actually in... The birth data. Look, um, there is a, and, and by the way, for people who are, are listening, um, this is a report <coughs> that we give to town meeting every year, mm -hmm. and it keep, every year we keep expanding it, and, and um, but there is a section in here on enrollment, mm -hmm. and I think there's some charts that you'd mm -hmm. find very interesting. One of them, um, and, and sometimes it's the way they're interrelated. If you, if you look at the current kindergarten, the, that cohort, when that cohort was born that first year, there were about, I think, mm -hmm. 510 students, mm -hmm. or children born then. Mm -hmm. our, our entering kindergarten class last year was, I think, 504 when we started, I think up to 513, 516 mm -hmm. right now. But that's almost a one-to-one. -one. That's 100% of your cohort mm -hmm. Born, uh, that was born that are in our kindergarten. Now, they're obviously not the same students. It's just the numbers. Mm -hmm. The cohort for next year is 560. <coughs> right now, we're pretty much as we were last year. I was going to give you a little update in kindergarten numbers. They keep changing. In fact, we have Ms. D'Agostino here tonight, who is our registrar. Um, we are at, I think, 454 as of today. That's about where we were last year, and by the end of the summer, we were at 504. So we've been seeing a retention rate from birth numbers at any, in the last couple of years, around 90%. It started out when I first started doing the, that, it was about 87, and it's been creeping up steadily, but this past year, it was, it was 100%. So even if we had 90%, which has been the last couple of years, we're, we're over 500 again. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm expecting to see in our kindergarten um, numbers this year. So that, that gives you a little bit of an idea of where we are. And then the, the, it stays pretty high after that, too. Uh, in fact, it gets up to the 600s. Mm -hmm. mm. Mr. Hainer, right. the, uh, the amount of students just to go along with what Ms. Stark said, I live in Kelwin Manor. Uh, when I first moved here 20 years ago, majority of the people m were my age, 
as each one of my generations move out, another family moves in, but they have two to three kids. Mm. Uh, I saw five kids. <laughs> I saw five kids and, and two houses move in. So, uh, so the, the the population is growing, but it's the mini part of the population that affects us. The other part that that scares the living daylights out of me, and it's nowhere near done, but the potential the project that may go into the Mugar property is talking about 280 plus houses if you do a one to four uh, that that's between 40 and 50 kids just hitting Hardy school I don't know where we're going to put them on the roof or something like that but I mean <laughs> we, I, I don't mean to be sarcastic but that is dramatic uh, so there was never an intent when they closed the elementary schools Arlington became unaffordable my wife and I grew up in this town we could not afford to live here. We left for 24 years. We came back. We didn't bring kids. That's the only thing. We didn't bring our kids with us. But other, the next generation, your generation, are not having children in their early 20s. They're able to afford this town, so they come into the town affording it. And that, if we knew what we knew now then, we would probably not have closed four or five of the elementary schools that are now condos and apartment houses and stuff like that. We didn't. We didn't, we haven't done it. And we don't have any place to grow except vertical. So it supports it. We cannot afford, I don't mean to be a snob. 20 years ago, I never thought I'd be saying something like that. We cannot afford any more residential, additional res residential. We're already growing with the existing residential that we have. Right. Thank you. Dr. Seuss. Uh, yeah, just a couple of points. Um, one is, I was really interested in census data too, and I looked at the mm -hmm. um, official uh, uh, numbers. Uh, one really interesting fact is that 60% of the people living in Arlington today were not here in the year 2000. So just showing how how much of a ch turnover. change, a turnover there's been. Um, and I think what's interesting also is that it's not shared equally among all the neighborhoods. And so sometimes you get people who are very well entrenched in the financial affairs of the, the town may not live in the neighborhoods where they see a lot of toddlers. Mm -hmm. Whereas in my street, <laughs> you know, you can't walk two feet without tripping over a toddler, basically. You know, it's very, it's, so it's not completely shared in all the neighborhoods. Um, a couple other points. Um, oh, one of the things I think it's really important for parents to know is that we're not just getting enrollment surges in the, uh, the kindergarten. We're getting them coming in at all levels. Mm -hmm. And I think that was actually one of the problems at Thompson, that August 1st, the fifth grade numbers this year didn't look that awful. Mm -hmm. But by September 1st, they did. <laughs> and that, that we are getting people come in, you know, at all the levels. Um, so sometimes people feel like, oh, why are not all the resources being put into the kindergarten? And that's because we actually have needs, overcrowding needs um, at, at every level in the district. Um, one final point that I want to say that I keep saying to lots of people. Um, this town has more room to grow in terms of mm -hmm. expanding uh, students mm -hmm. because n even if we never built another property, mm -hmm. there's a tremendous amount of properties, especially in East Arlington, where there's older people who at some point will decide they don't want to mow the lawn and shovel the sidewalks and might want to live in a, you know, an easier place. That's going to turn over and there's going to be new families. So I know a lot of people are really angry about development. I don't think that's if we stopped all development, I don't think we'd solve this problem. Okay, let, let's wrap, let's wrap up uh, uh, on this agenda item. I just want to say a couple things. First of all, for the parents who are with us, particularly for the parents who are concerned about the class size issues, yeah, we hear you and we understand this. And you can see by the charts that we have fiscal constraints on us. And the appropriating authority is town meeting. And there's a whole political context in terms of the way we govern our town. And we certainly appreciate having you here. We feel like you're the wind in our sails, and we would appreciate you being further involved in the civic affairs of the town. Uh, the other thing I want to say is that um, uh, it was our intent for this agenda item to be a preview of our uh, town meeting presentation, but the moderator uh, asked us to go early last night because the, uh, the capital budget was being advanced uh, to uh, accommodate Mr. Foskett's schedule. That's why we went uh, on Wednesday rather than having a discussion of what we were going to say and, and, and doing it next Monday. 
So for those who are town meeting members who want to get up and mention a couple of the statistics that we're having and, and talk about the challenges, when we get into the operating budget, that may not necessarily be a bad thing. Uh, and with that, we'll move on to the next agenda item, which is the elementary buffer zone report. Uh, Ms. D'Agostino, please come forward. Some of the parents here this evening may um, have even met Ms. D'Agostino um, mm -hmm. when they registered, mm -hmm. in, if not this year, even last year. Or maybe you recognize Good morning, this is Leilani Day. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we know your voice. <laughs> Tonight I am here to notify you about buffer zone analysis. For the next 15 minutes, please plan your day accordingly. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, good evening, Superintendent Bodie and uh, Chairman. Um, so, you know, I wanna, before I even begin my presentation, because there are some people that just know how much I love to talk to school committee. <laughs> I said 15 minutes, like solid 15 minutes. So I'm gonna just say, packing it all in in 15 minutes, there's a good chance I've forgotten something. So if there's something that you have requested that I have not covered in my meek little 15 minutes, please just let me know and I certainly will get you any answers, any data that you are seeking. So I, I preface by saying, moving fast for me on school committee is difficult. Um, I have the, the honor and the privilege of welcoming all the new people into the town. And I've done this now for a couple of years, so it really is kind of a, an exciting thing. And um, this is not the first time <laughs> that we're presenting, so I don't have to go all through every little thing. Mm -hmm. I think you all know what a buffer zone is. There's a picture just to refresh your memory. Um, but one thing I did want to note is we have made so many really important and good changes to the registration process. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest changes or, or concerns, or compl not complaints, but concerns that are voiced a lot is how do I know that I'm going to land in a buffer zone? And you know, they would come and say, I didn't even realize there was such a thing as a buffer zone. So we have really worked on addressing that. If you are on the Arlington Public Schools website and you go to school registration, or you go to school lo locator, you can find out this information quick. And a lot of parents who are calling saying, I'm thinking of moving to Arlington, but I just wanna know. It, it takes away that, that, um, that fear for them. So if they, are, if they are clicking on school registration and they are going into the packet to start answering the questions, they type in their address mm -hmm. and immediately their zone is popping up. So you can see here is the Hardy Thompson. So they already know. To some parents, it matters enough that they continue their search. To some parents, it doesn't matter at all. And you'll see that when we start to talk about the individual schools and the data. The second way, I'm not interested in registering. I, I got a call today from Germany, Munich, Germany. <laughs> and um, she, might be, she might be coming. And so I said, just go to School Locator, right on the phone with me. She's going to School Locator. She put in like 25 different addresses. Mm -hmm. I'm like, OK, ma'am, how much does this call cost? <laughs> <laughs> Um, but going to school locator, same thing. She typed in an address. She can see if she's going to land in a buffer zone. So that's something that has really set parents to the tone. When they come in, they know they're in a buffer zone. The first year when they came to meet with me, I don't even know what you're talking about. I'm like, okay. So I think that that's, that's an improvement in our plan, and, and we're pleased with how that's working. Now I'm going to jump into what you guys want, the data. Um, mm -hmm. We've broken this presentation down from March 2014 to September, the beginning of the academic year. And then we'll carry it throughout the year. And the reason we did that is because we do those, those six days of registration in March, those intense days where we bring in tons of people. But you'll notice when, when we move on, someone just registered on, I believe it was April 9th. So it is, I mean, it, this is, today is the 30th. 30th. So, 30th. you know, we're still registering continuously. Mm -hmm. And I know I don't have to read every single one of these slides to you because you're capable of reading them yourselves, but I did want to point out that from March of last year to the beginning of the academic year, of the children who registered, 157 of those children were in a buffer zone. So uh, Dr. Bodhi had, had said the numbers. There were 500 mm -hmm. children. How many? So the kindergarten yeah. was about five, four. Yeah, five, and four, so, yeah. Uh, you know, we have 157 in a buffer zone. So that you can see that we have lots of children in our school system. And I've broken it down so that you could see between March and September in the kindergarten how many children, just from March to September, 
117. These are just buffer zone numbers, just so these are not class numbers, these are buffer zone numbers. 117 in kindergarten, 14 in grade one, nine in grade two, six in grade three, four in grade four, and five in grade, uh, seven in grade five. So you can see what percentage of our populations are buffer zones. And, and it obviously varies, but you're absolutely right. When we had that large number in the Thompson fifth grade, mm -hmm. they were not buffer zones. Those were Thompson children. We have to put them in Thompson. <coughs> I'm doing good with the time so far, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So then we want to expand it from March all the way to April 6th so that you can get a full, 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 full view, excuse mm -hmm. me. Remember that we had a total of 157 two slides ago. Now we're looking at 180. So that's a significant increase in the number of buffer zone children in our system across the year. It, you'll notice it says 180 with an asterisk and 174. When we talk about registering children, we register children for a whole bunch of different reasons. Some children need to have some kind of testing or services. Um, and they actually attend private schools that might be coming in here, but we need to register them. So just for the fun of it, I wanted you to see that we do registrations beyond just kids going directly into classrooms. And the other thing that's important to note is that until a child physically sits in a chair, their registration is pending. So sometimes we have these numbers, but they don't actually show up. So our numbers do flux all the time. It's very fluid with, with registration. So, looking at the same kind of thing we did before, we're looking at the numbers. Now we have 123 children in kindergarten in a buffer zone. That represents 68%. That's, that's a fair number that we're gonna be looking at. 17 for grade one, 15 for grade two, seven for three and four, and 11 for five. So you can see there is a, there, that's a lot of children coming in after our school year has started. Mm -hmm. That's, that's something important to know. Where are these kids coming? We were talking about the census. Where are these kids coming from? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I get these like emails back from the principals so, like, stop sending <laughs> students. <laughs> <laughs> I never get the like, hey, how you doing? You know? <laughs> so um, like that. then I want, then we just took a quick look at the siblings <clears throat> because if you have a sibling in the school, you automatically attend that school. So it doesn't matter that you're in a buffer zone. If there's a sibling there, we always pair siblings. I think once we didn't, and it was upon the request of the family. So you can see that immediately, if you look at, say, the bracket school, immediately we had to place 12 children into the bracket because they had a sibling there already. So it didn't matter you know, how, what those numbers were before. They have to go to bracket because their sibling's already there. Now, of course, like Thompson only had two, but, but the 12 at bracket is significant. Then we wanted to see just by grade level, um, you know I love numbers, mm -hmm. so um, we just wanted to see what does it look like when we start talking about buffer zones. I know someone mentioned it earlier, it's not just kindergartens across our schools. So we did it by school and we did it by grade. Mm -hmm. And again, this is only buffer zone information. We're not talking about children who come to register, just to register, these are buffer zones. So like if you look at the Stratton school, seven of the children in the first grade between March and April of this year were buffer zone children that we had to make a decision about. And I can tell you, parents, we agonize sometimes about what to do, where to place children, looking at numbers and re-looking at numbers and looking at wait list requests. So it is not just a, a quick process. And um, you know, it's something like it starts in my office, goes back upstairs, comes back down to my office. So it, 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 we are taking lots of time on that. And then um, information of interest, I think this answers a few of the questions that the, that the school committee posed. What, what number and percent of buffer zone students? Again, that was 180, which represented 33%. And then what number of buffer zone students uh, placed were siblings? That represented 21%. And I have some other statistics with me because I just couldn't leave it alone. Um, sorry, I'd have to flip through the pages and put the glasses back on. What number of buffer zone students' re registration requests to be on a late wait list? 84% of people requested to be on a wait list. That's a significant number. But I should note that it's a process. 
So I don't know if you remember what the registration form looks like. I don't even know if some of you have actually had a chance to see our registration form. But there's all kinds of different questions. So the first question says, what school would you like to be in? Well, I want to be in bracket. OK. Then the next question says, do you wish to be on a wait list? And the answer is either yes or no. So what happens if it's blank? Hmm. Well, if it's blank, then then we don't have to honor a request because they didn't ask to be on a wait list. And sometimes people are actually saying no. So if we look at all those numbers and we say, what percent did we satisfy their request? The number was out of, out of, 100 and, and, um, and out of 123 people who said, I know what school I want to be on, and I want to be on a wait list, and I remembered to check yes, 123 of those people we satisfied 75 of them, which is 61%. So more than half of the people out there, we satisfied instantly, quickly, swiftly. Um, then when we, when we start looking at those numbers, we say, oh, 61%, what happened to the other 40%? What did you do with those? But when we break those numbers down, we say, how many people did not request, um, did not request to be on a wait list? And 11% of the people said, I, I don't care what school I go to. It doesn't matter to me. So we have to add that into the, to, to the numbers. And then beyond that, what people, what, what percent said, not, not, not it doesn't matter, actually said, no, don't put me on a wait list. If I don't get what I want right now, put me wherever you want. And that was 19%. Mm -hmm. So you see, we have actually some fair, fair percentages of numbers saying, it's OK where I go. And it's a kind of an interesting thing. Someone was complimenting um, the school a few minutes ago, the parents saying, you know, come to school committee and come to town meeting. I will say that it's the parents in the town of Arlington that do the greatest advertising for the schools because I actually know all about the schools. I know all about them because I research them and Dr. Bodie wants me to know about them. But when these parents come in and they have their buffer zone request, they're saying, here's why I want to go. Do you know what? My friend, blah, 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 blah. They can tell you story after story about what's so great about these schools. So we appreciate your love for our schools, surely. But, but you can see some of these statistics mm -hmm. do say, I love all the schools in Arlington. Place me where I should be. Um, so I think, I hope, if you have your like, little checklist over there that I've covered most of the questions that you, that you have asked. Um, and then you asked about Mill Street and Sim Circle. Mm -hmm. And um, the number of students from Mill Street is only seven for buffer zone. <clears throat> you know, and that they're all buffer zone, really, is in, the, mm -hmm. in those places. But from um, Sim Circle, it's 19. So, and again, these numbers now for this year, they're changing every day. Mm -hmm. I, I have to tell you, I have not had one day, mm -hmm. not one work day, that I have not done a registration. Mm -hmm. Um, in a month. So, you know, they'll, they'll keep coming in. And, the, and our census list, I don't know what goes on with our census list because the letters that we send out mm -hmm. versus the people that walk in, they're completely different names. <laughs> but we're working on it. We keep working on it. And um, now what I've done is some people don't even know what the schools are and the, what the buffer choices are. So I've just very quickly, I'm going to go through these very, very quickly. And if I go through them too quickly, which is unheard of for me, but if I, if I go through them too quickly, just, you know, pipe me down. Where's Mr. Where's Mr. Thielman? And if, if I go through it too quickly, you just let me know. I will do um, that. In the Bishop Bracket buffer zone, there were 23 children in the buffer zone. And of that, um, I'm not going to read everything on the screen, but of that, we requested three, three requests were satisfied immediately. But do notice the next line, six of the people did not even request a preferred school. So we have a lot of flexibility in those numbers. So when you look at that, you say, oh, well, if they only be satisfied three, well, six people didn't care where they went. So that's, that, is an important, that is something important to look at when we're looking at. Yeah, we, we've, we've seen, we, we know there's a batch of slides yeah. here. So if you just flip through them very oh, quickly. Oh, OK. Yeah. I don't even have to talk about them. That's even better. So <laughs> this is the Bishop Stratton. Mm -hmm. And this is the Bishop Thompson. And you'll notice on all of our slides, we are satisfying requests. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's that's an important thing that we are making we are satisfying requests, and then in an almost um, mm -hmm. like this one, only one student didn't get, only one parent didn't get what they need, requested originally. So these are these are nice statistics. Mm -hmm. And then my um, my last task was just to take a look at what's going on right now since March of this year, just which is a month. 
slightly over a month and a half, we have registered 452 students into um, kindergarten only, you know, and um, if you look at those numbers, we've resolved all of our buffers mm -hmm. uh, today. So this data is the most current data you can look at today. <clears throat> and that's it. That's and for <laughs> anyone watching at home or anyone in the audience who wants to take a closer look, that this is attached to our agenda document, uh, which is accessible from the website. Mr. Hainer. Uh, this does not necessarily go, it expands on the, your issue on the buffer zone. Can you give uh, uh, me the uh, full amount of students from Mill Street and uh, uh, Sims? The beyond. total amount, beyond the buffer zone that we have registered in our school district. Thank you. The, they're all, they're both in the buffer zone. They're all in buffer That's zones. It? That's, That's it. it. No. That's oh, it. Okay. She made the distinction that these were the ones just in the buffer zone. That's why I asked. Uh, the both projects are in the buff, in a buffer zone. So that number, that's all the right, yes. there are only seven and 19. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Pierce. So under our file policy JC, we have sample questions when we, when we report by the second meeting in October. But since we're talking about this now, I might as well pose a couple of the questions to you all here and see if they can be answered. Um, so is class equity improving? And are the desired results being achieved? Those are the, one, those are the two questions that I'm particularly interested in tonight. If you see the, every month you get the chart for the elementary schools, I, I would say if you could perhaps even compare it to before we had buffer zones, you'll see that the actually it's mm -hmm. been a little bit more even. I, I understand Thompson's fourth and fifth grade this year uh, went a little bit off that, um, that um, goal for sure. And some of it had to do from late registrations. but. Uh, in general, we've been able to do that because that's actually what the first thing I do when Leilani sends this up to me is I sit there with the, the number of students at each school and um, certainly look at parent choice, but what is the most important thing is, is it going to be, I'm going to try to improve the equity between the class at that grade level. And so yes, it is definitely helping. Is it perfect? No. Right. No. Will there be recommendations or or further um, data for us as the policy says in October? Yes. We yeah. apologize mm -hmm. that this report was not done this fall. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. we'll give you a report next fall on what where we are at you know up to the start of school. Thank you. I really like having it at this point too. So maybe we should institutionalize the. The two-step process. Uh, Ms. Starks. Uh, let's see. That one of my questions was if we needed to modify the <laughs> uh, policy. So mm -hmm. I guess we don't. Well, we will get them in the spring. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Um, one of the biggest problems we've heard is that waiting to find out where you're placed puts families at a disadvantage who need after-school care. Mm -hmm. So um, mm -hmm. because they don't know who to sign up with, mm -hmm. if you wait, you lose. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so that's become a that is starting to become an issue. And so um, I was wondering if we have, I don't have any solution. I just wanted to put it up there. But well, I we wish did. I did. Mm -hmm. uh, one, there's two things. One, we're going to try to speed it up a little bit more. But we've also sent an email to all the after school programs, and of course, two of them under uh, the public school control. Mm -hmm. So that's Thompson and Hardy. We're not considering. Uh, placement until the buffer zone uh, children have been placed mm -hmm. so that and but all of the schools have been asked to not not to um, go ahead with acceptance in the after-school program until this has been settled now what happens however is keep in mind we have 452 students same time last year we're still going to see another maybe 40 students 50 students um, they will not have that advantage. But the students that register in March, mm -hmm. and we do the buffer zones, which we've done all of those placements, um, we're asking the programs not to make any decisions until that's settled. And that's just obviously for kindergarten students, though? That's for I kindergarten students. I mean, they're going to roll up all their students, oh, the right, student just like we do. So We do those almost within the day or two. Oh, yeah. we, we're very quick on the, uh, the other grade levels. Mm -hmm. We've right. even, at some times, if it's, a, if it's not so busy, 
we can call upstairs. They'll give an answer immediately while, while the parent's still sitting in the office. So. Mm -hmm. Cool. Dr. Seuss. Thanks. Um, yeah, I was just wondering a little bit more about the process of taking, uh, when people get off the waiting list and satisfy and, and how the decision is made. Um, the, we're probably, we're going to do it in stages. We'll probably do one toward the end of May mm -hmm. and relook at where we, where we are with that and we'll go back to the, to parents who registered and we go by the date that they registered. Everybody that registered on the first night is all in the all same, the same. pool. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, we just simply go through that, okay. those lists. So just by date. Just by date, mm -hmm. just by date. Anyone else? Hearing none, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next item on the agenda is the superintendent's report. Well, actually, um, I have a few, a few things. And I did, since we still have um, a couple parents here from Stratton, I do, I do want to just mention, though we're going to talk a little bit more about this after my report, but I did want to um, mention a, um, a clarifying piece of information that was said here at the committee um, the last meeting and also was said last night at town meeting, that the cost of putting in um, a modular classroom at a school is $40,000. The actual cost for two classrooms is $250,000. And we may get a little bit of a um, uh, reduction by doing a, a, a large uh, hmm. purchase, actually rental. There's many costs in it that may not, people may not be aware of. Mm -hmm. um, not only is there installation costs, but there are rental costs. And the, these all total up, but the, the industry number, for, and they come in, uh, they come in cl two classrooms. Mm -hmm. the, the industry number is 250000 So that's important to know. And actually, the ones that are permanent, a little bit more than that. Just clarification, are we looking at two different types of modulus, ones that are going to be permanent at Audison after the fact, and the other ones that will disappear when, when Stratton is built? Yes. Are they at the exact same price, or are they Di different? Diane, um, there's a little bit of um, there's a little bit of difference here. The um, depending on how we spec out the modulars themselves, they will either be deeply rehabbed or brand new. If we're putting in permanent ones, the sales rep we spoke with said it's most likely that they will be new. Um, the the ones that we'd be leasing as temporary ones would either be new or rehabbed to meet our specifications. But but the ones that, that are going to be permanent, they're designed for that, where the other ones are not designed for permanency. No, even the ones we'd be leasing will meet our specifications in terms of what we're looking for. Now, I understand that, but the ones that, we are going to, that are going to disappear once Stratton is up and running, they're a different, they're a different type, aren't they? Not As opposed to the ones that we're looking to have for at least 10 to 15 years at uh, I'm, I'm told not significantly. The principal difference would be that in, it, with, a, with putting in new ones, which we would buy most likely rather than lease, but we'll look at the numbers both ways, will be, you know, almost surely brand new construction. The ones that we'd be leasing could either be new or rehabbed. So I guess when... It, so they could be identical. The difference would be that in, in, in the end of the project, the temporary ones would be put on trucks and carried away. I'm not trying to sound like an attorney, but the, the $250,000 figure may have some flexibility in it when we, between the two, the um, new and the no. old. No, the, the permanent ones will be more, well, it depends on whether we lease or buy and how long the lease is. I understand. But I, it's 250 either way at least, probably more for the permanent ones. Thank you. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, Mr. Pierce? <clears throat> Uh, yeah, I was on, on the space issue and the modular issue. There is space next to the high school that's for sale, right? <laughs> Isn't there? Yeah. Do you mean the building over here in Schuller Court? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Could it the be. The print shop over here? Yeah, the print yeah. shop. It's for sale. Okay. Could it be that that could be utilized in some fashion by the school department, just putting it out there as a purchase for administration and then have the sixth floor and have more of the space at the high school turned over for, say, eighth grade. <clears throat> We've been thinking about it. I'm not going to say any more. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, let, so let, me, let me just uh, state that uh, 
uh, we're at the beginning of the process, and there are a lot of variables that we're going to play with and talk about, and that there's a, a agenda item to move this over to, to the facility subcommittee later so we can really do some exploration. Mr. Hainer. Dr. Bodhi, are you going to be talking tonight at all about the space study that uh, we're, we're getting involved in, analysis of our space needs? I wasn't planning it, but I could re-mention it. Okay. I, 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 well, I in my presentation last night, which was actually what I was going to talk I, about. Okay. My only request is that, or question to you is, we're going to look at all school existing property in that analysis. Am I correct? Yes. Okay. Thank you. I mean, ones that we may not be currently running programs in as well. Mm -hmm. The junior high east is what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Well, no, we're not. No, no, at that's it. not <clears throat> going to be. In, what we're going to what we're going to find out at the end of this, first of all, is a verification of our enrollment numbers with a much more comprehensive uh, uh, analysis. What we do is we basically, which is what a lot of districts do. This is the best practice in in, in projections. We look at our the cohort numbers and what the retention is. And all. you've heard this before. Yeah. This is this the person who's doing this analysis, looking at home sales and just a. A lot of metrics that we don't look at normally. I guess what I'm looking at is that we, we I think we've all accepted we have a growth problem, mm -hmm. a growth related, a space problem related to a, a population growth in the town. And we have to become very creative. All of our elementary schools mm -hmm. uh, are bulging right now. Mm -hmm. uh, I suggested, I guess what I'd like us to do is look at all spaces that we have control of right now, possibly the one that Mr. Pierce just mentioned. It doesn't mean we're going to buy them. Doesn't mean we're going to refab them or anything. I, I know you're talking about a creative. particular. I, you're talking about what what we will be doing is finding out mm -hmm. approximately how many classrooms we're going to need okay. in this for the school district mm -hmm. and where, mm -hmm. and where because this is which where is the growth happening under the best. So we're, once we know that, then there's going to be decisions that we're going to have to make as a town. Right. And some if, of, if if Thompson has just throwing numbers, they may be wrong, but, but 26 classrooms and the analysis comes out that we need 32 class or we need 33 classrooms. The reality is we're not going to be able to put a block on the top of the building. We're going to have to be more creative somewhere else. So I just wanted us to be, look at as much as we can in this, in this thing so we don't have to go back and have to look at it again. I, I want to take right. advantage of this study as, as I'd like to, us to look at this as broad as we can. We may not need that broad look later on, but have it available to us as options. Thank you. The, the other thing is, is that uh, with the MSBA, uh, they're only allowing us to do one project at a time, and we're sitting in a, in a huge honking project. So that sort of limits what we can do on other sites until we resolve our high school issue. But, but we also, right now, we're, re, re, we're dealing with Stratton right now mm -hmm. outside of MSBA. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I think if the town realizes to spend some money today to save some money tomorrow, mm -hmm. they'll be willing to listen to us. I they mean, have I, been very good about that. Yeah, we, we should have everything on the table without a Thank doubt. Thank you. Oh, we will. And I, th I think once we get that, there's certainly going to be a lot, of dis a lot of discussion here at this table. Mm -hmm with the town manager, with the board of selectmen, this is what we're going to have. This is why I want us to look at the junior high east and all the properties that we have. It may not be viable. The dollar figure may turn around and say it's prohibitive and we, but we'll then know definitely. We won't be guessing. You won't have me hounding you for it. Okay. Continue. <laughs> well, uh, Mr. Slickman did say that one of the, th we've planned, or I had planned this evening to um, show you the slides and the, the main points I wanted to make as part of our presentation. But then I, I learned that um, capital was going to be taken out of order um, because Mr. Mr. Fawcett wasn't going to be there Monday night. Most likely budgets will be taken up Monday evening, later in the evening. Um, but because we had two, three major items in the capital budget, Stratton, um, the um, technology mm -hmm. allocation, and turf. I wanted to be able to you know, address and, and ask for the support of town meeting before um, that budget was taken up. Um, so last night, I, I had, we'd been working on this. It turns out I had to really sort of speed it up and not say every, absolutely everything that I wanted to say. But I did want to just show the slides, because there's some really, I think, some very important ones in here that um, 
it sort of speaks a lot of what we talked about even this evening. Well, first, that you, you've seen this before. We don't have to spend a lot of time on it. But I think what, for a lot of people who don't understand about school budgets, and there's always people for the first time that they, they think the town appropriation is our budget, and it's, it's not. It's certainly the vast majority, which is sort of the gold here, the, the large part of the largest part of the circle. But the other sectors of the circle um, refer to our, our fees and grants. Um, but what I wanted to, because one of the questions that I think as a town we, all, we always want to reflect on is are, are we really getting the value for the dollars we spend on education? Um, certainly there's some people that think that probably we're spending too much money on education. Um, but it, in, in that kind of discussion and analysis, it's always good to take a look at other communities. And a couple of years ago, and in fact, um, it, was, it was put into the um, FY16 annual budget and financial plan, there is now a group of communities called the, uh, the Town Manager 12, we call them the T12 communities, that were chosen by uh, town, school, and union leadership as being the most comparable to Arlington. And there, uh, there were a lot of metrics that were looked at, um, in fact, a couple, I think uh, uh, Dr. Allison Ampey was on that committee as well. That that doesn't mean that all these communities are cookie cutters of each other. That they're obviously very individual and very different, but they they're comparable on these metrics. And these communities are Belmont, Brookline, Medford, Melrose, Milton, Natick, Needham, North Andover, Reading, Stoneham, Watertown, and Winchester. Mm -hmm. Now. What you see here in this graph is the per pupil expenditures for each of these T12 communities. And the red bar is Arlington. So we are right in the middle in terms of what we spend uh, for education. But then the next slide or lower is the slide that shows how we do in academic achievement of our students. Um, and this is measured by standardized tests. So while we are in the middle for per pupil, we are on the high end for achievement, which I think really speaks to lots of things. First of all, we've got great schools. We have, and we're, I was talking before about how wonderful the teachers are at a particular school, but I would say that that is in general true in Arlington. And I think our reputation is, is out mm -hmm. there and people want to be here. And I, I sort of take the enrollment increase mm -hmm. as a challenge, of course, but I also see it's, a, it's quite an affirmation of the work that we're doing and I think it's bringing in a, a tremendous diversity into our, into our, our schools, mm -hmm. which I, I think is just wonderful. But it doesn't have, it has its challenges too. I'm not saying that it doesn't. But I think this speaks loudly to what the, what's going on. Mm -hmm. And we're doing a great job. Um, we obviously always want to do better. Maybe that's part of what the energy of our district is all about. So going on, this is the graph that we've been talking about tonight uh, that demonstrates what we're projecting in the way of enrollment growth here. Diane, did you want to talk a little bit about the, the different colors in there? Sure. Um, the, the teal down at the bottom is elementary, the red in the middle is the middle school, and the yellow at top is high school. And you can see that initially, going back to 07, that the growth is really taking off at the elementary level, but that as over time it's phasing up because obviously those larger elementary classes are rolling through to the top. As Dr. Bode was saying that we have a kindergarten class above 500, our senior class is about 300. So that gives you a sense of the change over time and just in a relatively short span of years. So as these classes, and we have classes above the kindergarten that are in the mid to high fours, as they roll up, you know, if we have three classes of 500 at the middle school, that's a very different middle school than what we have now. Yeah, and, and it's, this space study, of course, is gonna deal with um, heavily into the elementary because we already know when we're looking here, we're looking at maybe 1,600 at the high school 
at the time that the high school actually would be renovated and rebuilt. So we're, we're, we're anticipating what's going to happen here. Now, the, the issue is Audison. We, we can only be engaged in an MSBA project one at a time. And, um, and so we've got this situation where we're really focused on the high school. We're able to finish our, our elementary school with town money. And I, I take my hat off to the Capital Planning Committee for being able to figure out all the funding for this. But we do have our middle school sitting there with enrollment growth that's hit, starting to hit it now. It, 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 this, this year, the next two years are going to be a little tight, but what's going to happen is when the larger, kindergarten, uh, larger classes at the elementary school um, are there in 18-19, we're really I think beyond our ways of being creatively handling space at the mm -hmm. middle school. And yet, we could be in the middle of a study here at the high school committing monies, mm -hmm. bonding, trying to get bond money for the high school, and there isn't capacity mm -hmm. in the town to deal with added classrooms at the middle school. So this idea of putting modulars there that are going to be permanent really addresses two needs and I, I know that I fully get that there's issues around that parents are unhappy at Stratton about fourth grade at um, the p potential fourth grade and I will say a couple comments about that in a minute but being able to put some portables at Audison that will remain is going to be able to solve that problem for those years when we are not going to be able to address a permanent solution there and we don't even know if we need a permanent solution. That's actually one of the reasons we want to verify our enrollment growth. Are we seeing a bubble that's, going to, that's just going to eventually flatten out? I don't know. And we need to find that out. So we certainly don't want to build 12 more classrooms onto Audison and then find that they're, we don't need them in 10 years either. So that's another issue. If I may, Mr. Chair. Yeah, Mr. Haney. Last night in the capital planning, <coughs> in this part of the Stratton financing plan. In FY17, they're going to uh, tr uh, allocate the major amount of money for construction mm -hmm. and uh, relocation of students, Stratton. But also in 17, they put down capital appropriation for additional classroom space at Audison. And the money they put was 500000 mm -hmm. Using the figure before, that may translate into four mm -hmm. classrooms. Is that correct? Eight. Go ahead, Diane. If I may, um, I'm a member of the Capital Budget yes, Committee, so you. I'm a little closer to these details. Um, the hope is is that we can kill two birds with one stone. I understand the rationale behind it, but mm -hmm. I mean, I was at the the two hundred fifty thousand dollar figure was used before for two classrooms. Am I correct? That five hundred thousand dollar figure that was in for the Audison wasn't necessarily thinking. You know, it wasn't that modulars were the only possible solution with that funds. Another solution might have been to create very state-of-the-art um, workrooms for teachers so that teachers would no longer have their own classrooms but be situated in a workroom okay. and the classrooms. I mean, there's all kinds of things you could do with space. And, okay, and setting you, a, earmarking some money to deal with space is a, just a good idea given our enrollment I situation. saw the $500,000 figure. I saw the two, I heard you say 250. I made that assumption. So, the, so it's it, you st it's still in the planning stages, and you, you correct. Look. So the intent is to have the five hundred thousand dollars appropriated, and hopefully by then you'll there'll, it, there'll be a an idea of where we're going and things. If like that. if the modulars so if the modulars are the ultimate plan, and it's still in the planning phases, what it would allow us to do is utilize those funds set aside for Audison growth, utilize funds from the project for the Stratton, and be able to get more at the Audison than we could afford alone, have a better situation for the Stratton, and ideally still have enough money in the Stratton to do the kind of last end stuff on the project that we want, like computers and those kinds of things. Because you know our total project costs, the more we spend on relocation, the less we have to spend on the project. It's an all in package that was voted. So if we think about the 12, mm -hmm. what, 12 one that was voted last night, for the Stratton, the and then the extra half million for Audison space. If we can combine them, we can do a better thing in both locations. Just for clarification, the number that was voted was 12 million for, it was under Stratton, but it had that line for Audison in it. So we're not looking at a separate 500,000 from the Stratton. So is, is it is it 12 four with? 12 0 7 5 9 4 0. So it was 12 one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, 
Yeah, the, uh, they're, I'm just, they're held separately. It's 25, mm -hmm. okay. But all I'm saying is that $500,000 is not on top of that. It's mm -hmm. part of that 12, one. Okay. I'm looking right at the chart from their, their report. You have the advantage of me, sir. Okay, um, next item. Um, let me just finish one more okay, graph because this is actually okay. really this yeah. is really interesting. And I don't know if it shows up as well as it could, but at any rate, um, this was a, a, a very surprising news I, news item that came out on April 20th, and what it is is was a, a national study of looking at where they call the creative class is choosing to live and to be, mm -hmm. um, not necessarily where they work, but but where they in those work in those areas where are they choosing to live and this was done by um, uh, Dr. Richard Florida who is the co-founder and editor of City Lab which is uh, the media arm of the Atlantic Ag magazine and he's an editor at the Atlantic and a professor at NYU so at any rate at the creative class is defined is composed of high paid knowledge workers We've been talking a lot about 21st century creative thinking, mm -hmm. uh, the kind of um, preparation we want for the, the jobs that are in the future. And so these are people in the fields of science and technology, arts, culture, media, business, mm -hmm. management, media, I mean I said that, mm -hmm. healthcare and education. So these are people who, mm -hmm. their work is all about their knowledge and, and thinking, mm -hmm. all right? So the lead, the list is the, is the areas of the country that are dominated um, with this group of people. And the, the big groups are in Northern California, mm -hmm. um, D.C. area, and Boston. Hmm. There's a couple of outliers, like there's Hoboken, New Jersey, and I think there's something up in Washington, which is, of course, just Dublin, Japan. Ohio. But the thing that was really interesting, which I think sort of caught us all <coughs> by surprise, is that the four communities in Massachusetts are Arlington, Brookline, Cambridge, and Newton. This is where people are choosing to live. <laughs> so what we're, what we're I think good. the thing to note is that Hoboken outranks us. <laughs> <laughs> That's where my daughter is, so. <laughs> so what is going on in Hoboken? I, <laughs> Hoboken? Hoboken's a cool place. It is a cool, it is a cool, it is a cool yeah, place. Yeah, yeah, there's three places in Maryland. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it's D.C. It's all D.C. D.C. Uh, Dublin, Ohio? Yeah. Well, can, you, can you make it bigger, Diane? Is that I the, uh, no. I, I'm sorry, Julie and I played with this <laughs> quite extensively. We tried different colors. Um, Actually, yeah. is this is, is this PDF? on anywhere? I know it's not on the agenda. Yeah, oh, I can put it up. Okay. Go down at the bottom. It I should think pop it up. wasn't put in. It's it wasn't. It's not on there. Oh, no. I can oh. put all these slides okay. in the. Uh, yeah. That would be Thanks. great. Um, so the it this reflects what we've been talking about here. Twenty first century learning is about inquiry and critical thinking and mm -hmm. how you um, how you or you know you you do executive functioning about the kind of learning that you do. So. Enough said on that. Um, so at any rate, our emphasis on building for the habits, the strong habits of mind in the 21st century is totally in line with the, the people who are choosing to come and live here in Arlington. And I think that was one of the, um, so that was one of the important points I wanted to get across. But I also want to mention that, I don't think I did. While this book is in hard copy for town meeting members, anybody who would like to see it, and there's just loaded with mm -hmm. wonderful information from principals and curriculum leaders about the um, very innovative and creative things that have been going on and awards. You have to go to the high school section and look at all of the awards that have been, mm -hmm. that, that they've had in the last year too. So it's online, it's on our district website. I do have a couple other things. All right, mm -hmm. all right. But you're probably gonna wanna do about Day in the Hill after mm -hmm. anyway. Yeah. Um, the Japan, our visit from our sister city uh, from Japan is going extremely well. Naga Okakio. Naga Okakio. Naga Okakio. You say it faster than you. Yeah, right. But they, we've had uh, visitors at Addison, Dallin, and tomorrow they'll be here at the high school. And um, uh, from what I understand, well, I've seen them perform and they've just been terrific. It's a big class this year, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, we had a big 26. group. 26, yeah. Mm -hmm. And we have more high school students than we've had in the past. We had, mm -hmm. we have 10. Huh. Um, Laura, <coughs> what, uh, Dr. Cheston is going to talk a little bit about some 
PD that we've just recently um, had that just two things I want to mention. Sure. Um, we had about uh, we had 17 teachers and math coaches attend the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics National Conference uh, about a week ago. Uh, five coaches attended a pre-conference meeting that uh, was targeted to fine-tune their already excellent uh, math coaching skills. Um, and it was an opportunity for them to meet with their peers who do the same job alike across the country. So it's a really a, a great opportunity for them. Um, they do have each other, but they're, you know, we only have the, the sort of the ways we do things in Arlington. So it gave them an opportunity to yeah, it was, um, I was there. <laughs> talk. <laughs> it's, it's awesome to be surrounded by, you know, your own mm -hmm. teacher. But it was funny, I was in a talk, and uh, the person who was speaking said, I don't know if any of you know where this is, but I actually got my start here, near here, in a, a school called Audison Middle <laughs> School. <laughs> and this woman stood up in the back and she goes, I teach there now. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, this is so funny. But mm. yeah, he was a Spanish teacher at Audison. Mm -hmm. He became a math teacher, and now he was back giving a talk at NCTM, so it was pretty funny. He saw the light, right? Yeah. <laughs> Ms. Starks. Um, and uh, so it was a great opportunity for, e for the math teachers also at the middle school and the high school to sp uh, speak to other math teachers across the country. And today we had uh, the kickoff of a grant that we talked about a little bit um, a couple weeks ago when um, Ms. Hansen was here about the teacher leadership program. So three principals, two curriculum directors, and um, Ms. Hansen, uh, and four teachers uh, and myself uh, attended a full day workshop on activating teacher leadership. And we will be having um, in the third, second or third week in May, um, another two hour meeting to begin what that planning will look like for next year. Um, the, the interesting part of the uh, conference, the workshop, was that there were teams from Arlington, there was a team from Dedham, and there was actually a team from Kentucky. So uh, the, certainly this workshop um, is well known enough and uh, the presenters enough to have people come all the way from, from Kentucky. So it was a great opportunity. And the last thing, um, Dr. Allison Ampey, I'm sorry she's not here tonight because I wanted to give an update on the high school security. This was a question mm -hmm. asked. I wanted you to know that 29 of the cameras that are at our exterior doors are, have be, are going to be upgraded and that process has already started. More LED lights have been inst installed around the school and that's coming from a grant. Um, and we're able to also update all of our two-way uh, radios, which we had set, put in for a grant, but we've been able to figure out how to fund that and which will be augmented by the repeater that was put up here on the sixth floor, which, which help amplifies the signal. So there has been some mm -hmm. progress in this area. And that, that's it. Thank you, Dr. Bodie. Next <coughs> order of business is uh, agenda item refer Stratton correspondence to subcommittee. Uh, just as a uh, note to uh, casual observers of the school committee, is these meetings are fairly formal and uh, there's always a lot of process before a decision gets to this point and most of this conversation and deliberation takes place in subcommittee where we have a much more informal environment that we can include more people and have much more of an extensive uh, discussion and it seems that this is an appropriate thing to do with the topic of the uh, Stratton uh, relocation. So I'd like to entertain, uh, to hear a motion to refer the correspondence from the Stratton parents to the facility subcommittee. So moved. Second. Uh, moved by Ms. Stark, seconded by Mr. Oh, Hainer. Any Seuss. discussion? Uh, 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 Dr. <laughs> Seuss, uh, I'm thinking the committee chair. Are we I'm, giving I'm, it I'm, to, I'm, yes, I'm exactly. Where we are. Uh, mo motion by Dr. Seuss, seconded by Mr. Hainer. Uh, any discussion? Ms. Starks. So um, I guess one of the things that I would, as the chair of the facilities subcommittee, which I'm more than happy to take this on, mm -hmm. um, but one of the things that I would like to know from the committee is, I guess, do you have any input or any insight as to what kinds of things you want to see happen and or what kinds of things the superintendent already have planned? <laughs> So right. those are the two things, I, questions okay. I have as far as, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. in my mind, I think that, you know, I, I, I wasn't as involved, and so I would love to talk to you about the Thompson rebuild mm -hmm. and kind of how that went. But, I mean, my thought is that 
probably we're at the point. I know we finally got you know approval for the funding to start the planning phase. Um, is to you know the first order of business should maybe to start thinking about when we want to have some regular meetings with parents and mm -hmm. regular kind of information updates and what kind of media we want to put that on and where we want to have it and all of that kind of stuff. But I mean, I don't know. I know Dr. Bodie, you've been driving this, so. I, I know one thing is that, that we there are a lot. There's a lot we don't know about portable classrooms. That's something we haven't dealt with in the past. And what are the siting requirements? Uh, what are the costs? What are the long-range needs? Uh, all the things that are surrounding uh, where we need to go with this, I think, would be an appropriate uh, conversation to have and to take this opportunity to uh, involve the community. So let me go to Mr. Hainer. My understanding is the, the forming of a, the committees uh, with the parent input and stuff, uh, I too want to see the charge for this thing, but it usually goes to the superintendent who sets up the parent uh, mm -hmm. connection uh, mm -hmm. committee and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not trying to take anything away. No, no. But I think the facilities committee, from my perspective, I'd like to I'll put this up there for discussion, is that to take these letters right now that we've all received, give, a, give the parents in, in the community, the Stratton community, an opportunity to have an open conversation with school committee members and have the facilities committee bring it back. Part of that may be creating questions mm -hmm. that you just, yep. with regard to the uh, portables, mm -hmm. uh, the timing, the schedule, again, going back to a, that mm -hmm. unified message coming out of the facilities committee. Mm -hmm. And I, th I see the subcommittee as always being the conduit back and forth to us mm -hmm. and share. But I think a list of things, and one of the things I'd like to suggest is hearing from the parents and getting their concerns. Uh, one of them right now is location for some of them. But I think that the other parents, as a parent, I'd want to know about what a portable is. Mm -hmm. I know what a classroom is. I've been in the classrooms. We right now don't have any portables. Mm -hmm. right. And uh, is there a, have these questions go from the facilities committee if the superintendent is in there or to, to whoever, through mm -hmm. Diana or whoever, to get these information to have this positive uh, interaction with the people. So. Right. Yeah, right. Um, we are, the town is moving forward in setting an RFP out for a designer. That process will take probably another six weeks. We're, hopefully a designer will be selected by the end of May. Mm -hmm. So really a lot of this is just sort of on hold. I know there's a, an anxiousness to get mm -hmm. talking about it, but as I said with this, when, when Ms. Johnson uh, went to all these different schools mm -hmm. with the vendor, mm -hmm. with an architect, with our director mm -hmm. of facilities, these were the strong mm -hmm. recommendations mm -hmm. as to sites. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was, it was fair to say what the, the strong recommendations were. It was, it's been discussed. Mm -hmm. But all of this has to be revisited when you actually get the designer mm -hmm. on board and, and going and doing another, you know, a verification, mm -hmm. another analysis. We may come back to the, exactly the same thing because one of the things we found out is not all of our elementary schools are designed very well for the addition of, of modulars, which is actually an issue <laughs> looking to the future. But. Um, so we need to have another look at that. So the mm -hmm. plan would be the, the concentrated time will probably be in June because we need to have the modulars um, ordered by August 1 at the latest. And you need, an, you need a period of time where you bid. And so that would probably be, the bidding time will be July. So it's gonna be a very intense per period of time. Really between now and then, you can, we can gather information. Now, you should know that Mr. Hainer, uh, uh, Mr. not Mr. Hainer, but Mr. Hanna, the principal of the Stratton, has um, is putting together has put together a parent committee, mm -hmm. and I don't know who's on the committee. He's sending. I, I, I'm not sure exactly where that stands right now. To have that committee be a funnel of information about concerns. At the meeting I had at Stratton, we had the assistant principal mm -hmm. of the middle school there, taking. I have four pages, five pages of notes mm -hmm. of things that, to consider. Um, and so, and I've seen all these emails as well. So we know what the, I the issues are. At this point, there's not much we can do until we get the designer mm -hmm. 
and start looking doing another analysis of where what's the best situation just for clarification <clears throat> you're talking about june july and august uh, not of 2015 but of 2016. Mm -hmm. no or this now. okay uh, this that's one what, that's <laughs> this, this one, one now so yeah. they need to be ordered a year in advance a year in advance okay, that's what i need okay so the motion is to refer the correspondence to the subcommittee for discussion the correspondence focuses on the sighting of the fourth grade at the Stratton at mm -hmm. the Addison. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so what's the most effective way to have that to, to address this? And the most, and what's the mm -hmm. time frame for it? What do you, so I'm, could you summarize what, you know? The, the, <clears throat> the most effective way to communicate is through the parent committee at Stratton. That's not, not to say they don't come to facilities. That's, I think, perfectly mm -hmm. fine. I've certainly gotten emails. I'm gonna go back in June and meet with the parents again once I have more information. Um, right now, I have no more information. This is where the recommendation is, and we have to re-look re at it. Um, and the, and, and the, I will also have probably the first, the, first, uh, the enrollment growth report, mm -hmm. probably have that by late May, mm -hmm. we hope, <laughs> I know. So, um, but I also wanna look at that, because that's another big mm -hmm. piece of information in terms of how to think about this. So does the, sub, does the school committee, are we, so would the subcommittee be making a recommendation to the school committee for any vote on anything? Or who's gonna, are we, are we I mean, what's, I mean, yes, I don't see it's this. Well, that's what I'm trying to do. Yeah, I, we certainly bring everything back to you, but it's going to come from the experts and what they think it, are the are possibilities. Now, maybe there's gonna be more possibilities and we have to make some choices. I don't know yet. Because, I mean, do you envision the full school committee voting on a plan for the siting of the, of the modulars? I think that that would be a good idea to have a vote of the committee of the the school committee. When, now, the only problem is <clears throat> could be timing. July. Yeah, it'd have to be probably <laughs> a uh, probably a late June meeting or something. So or the July so meeting. the subcommittee would meet to review the correspondence and inform the committee's vote mm -hmm. on the siting of the modulars, mm -hmm. right? Is that, am I, is that you don't have to vote on the siting of the modulars. Be good. Mm -hmm. That's not. It's not required. Yeah, okay. It's not required. <clears throat> yeah. It's not yeah, required. Uh, I, I just. <coughs> I think it would be a good idea. You know, you, the thing you, is. Okay, so. The yeah. thing is, we if, we, if we are to make a decision on this, which I think is certainly within our domain, we need to be well informed. Mm -hmm. uh, and right now, I don't think there's anybody <coughs> in, in this group who is an expert enough on this topic to go and have any kind of an informed conversation about where we should put modulars, the cost of the modulars, the advantages and disadvantages of placement of kids in these modulars, any of this stuff. We, we don't have enough information to carry on a, a, a logical conversation. At the end of this process, at the very least, we should be able to carry on an intelligent conversation about what we're doing and why we're doing it and, and have the input of the community as the process moves forward and to have an open process so that people with different ideas and thoughts on this can get them before us so we so so every option can be considered and weighed as we're moving forward and understand that while there may be a committee at stratton that's been put together by the principal any of our meetings are open meetings and everybody is welcome to attend and in the case of the subcommittees everybody is welcome to come and participate so there, there is nothing exclusive about having a conduit through a committee at any of the schools. It's just one method, and that any parent group who wants to be involved to communicate through, through a separate channel is more than welcome to uh, engage with the chair of the committee and, and, uh, and, and work through the process. Mr. Hainer. I'm confused. We don't need the portables until a year mm -hmm. from now, a uh, year from September. Mm -hmm. The only money that has been appropriated is for design, not the purchase of the modules. That's right. The money's available after July 1. Mm -hmm. Not for the modules. The modules will not be appropriated until from uh, capital planning until next school, uh, town meeting. Well, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Ms. Johnson. Okay. We're going to we're going to have the designer develop we're going to figure out how many modules we need and where we need them they're going to produce a professional specification to go out to bid because we have to bid for these modulars. We can't just go pluck them off the shelf. I understand. Okay, so all of those pieces, 
there's enough money available to get the ball rolling. We wouldn't start making lease payments on the rental modulars or payments on the Purchase modulars whatever. until they show up. Fine. So that's where the timing of the two years, the, the million dollars set aside for design and for the initial pieces is sufficient. By the time the modulars, they can be pre-ordered, they can be contracted. By the time they show up and we start paying, we'll be into the next fiscal year. I think the need for, of the facilities committee, if that's where it's going to go, because we've heard a lot of the, the concerns from the parents and stuff, besides the location, I think it's important for them to understand what a modular is mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. things of that nature. These are things that can be done in, in the next couple of months. Mm -hmm. to, to, we want everybody to be on our side, and I think it's important. Mm -hmm. if, the, if the people come to the Facilities Committee, and, I, and Cindy, I apologize, but whatever need you can do as soon as, you know, the time factor. But to get this back to you folks, to get answers so that they feel an active part involved in this, uh, this thing, uh, to maintain a partnership. Mm -hmm. uh, the location part, uh, I, I, I would hope, that we're not set in stone mm -hmm. uh, for all the locations. There may be other ways to look at it. Thank you. Mr. Pierce. Well, I think what we did with the buffer zone conversation, which was a very agonizing one, and, and, and it brought a lot of uh, uh, voices from the community out pro and con, was that we looked at um, other communities who had done mm -hmm. similar things. Mm -hmm. And uh, we looked at Brookline, for example. And <coughs> I'd love the facility subcommittee to look at other towns who have gone through enrollment bursts mm -hmm. and bubbles and, and see how they handled it and, and did they have modulars, where did they put them, and see if there's any comparables that you can derive from, from that look. Dr. Seuss. Um, yeah, I just want to say, I mean, given our space constraints, there's no way to come up with the perfect solution. Um, you know, Thompson had the same situation. They had third grade split into three different schools. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't ideal. Um, what I think at the end of the process we want to see is that everyone understands why the decisions have been mm -hmm. made. Mm -hmm. So that even if the decisions are not the best ones that you would, in an mm -hmm. ideal world, you want to have, you understand, was it made for financial reasons? Was it made just be for, for logistical reasons? We just can't put a modular there. Just have a really clear understanding of why the what the decision process was. And I, that's, I think, our goal. Mr. Thielman? It seems like the most effective meeting would be one in which we have the designer present. Mm. So when would that be okay. possible? Well, the, with the RFPs, I mean, or here, it won't be the person. The firm will not be selected till probably in May, mm -hmm. late May. That's mm -hmm. everything going to schedule, and then th they're going to need some time to sort of get the lay of the land and do their analysis. So I think it would probably be July. In which, he, in which a designer could come and make a presentation about all the our different last options. Meeting is Cause, I mean, cause possible. The, the, expert, the expert on mm -hmm. modulars and siting is not, I mean, you have knowledge of it, but the expert is the designer. Um, the designer would be, I think it would be probably useful to have both the designer, but it might even be more useful to start out with the sales rep from a modular company to come and show some examples of classrooms and explain how okay. they work, how mm -hmm. they're set up, you know, what they look like, the fact that they're both heating and air conditioning controlled at the classroom level, that most of them come with bathrooms within that piece of the building. Um, they're just, they're very interesting and widely used mm -hmm. throughout the nation. And I think it, you know, I think people have an image. I know I did at first. Um, in, in middle school, I was in a tumbled down, rotting old modular, and it wasn't too great. They've come a long, long way. Mm -hmm. They're a very different thing now. All right. Mr. Hainer. Yeah. I'm going to put the elephant on the table right now. Stratton has been the hotel for all of our rebuilds. Mm -hmm. This is the only school that's being asked to go to modules. The parent tonight, I hopefully expressed what most of the parents believe. Mm -hmm. They've accepted that, they understand the module thing, but they want the elementary experience. Mm -hmm. And I understand and I applaud the, the two for aspect of, of, of maximizing the needs that we have in our growth and things like that. But I want us, and Dr. Seuss mentioned it before, there's, there's a reality fact that everybody isn't going to get everything they need. But I want us to keep an open mind to, to all aspects in this. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I don't think we'd be engaging this process if we didn't have an open mind and we're looking right. for any good idea that would land on the table. Uh, are we ready for a vote? I, I just, Dr. No. <laughs> Thielman. Yeah, so the only thing is the, sure the um, I don't want to raise expectations about a timeline if we're talking about I mean, when do you think that when there's, so there's no, a motion is 
Review the, review the correspondence, no timeline, no date certain, nothing like that. Uh, correct, we're just okay. referring it so that the uh, esteemed chair of the committee and her uh, excellent colleagues can work with the Stratton community and anyone else who's interested in modular classrooms to uh, gather facts and kind of, so we can come <laughs> to an understanding we can work. Cool. Mm -hmm. Okay. And now we're ready for a vote. Uh, a uh, motion on the table is to refer correspondence to the uh, facility subcommittee. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous vote, six to nothing. Um, and that takes care of that issue. Now we go down to the consent agenda. Um, all items on the consent agenda will be subject to one vote. Um, I will ask that the uh, Addison, the, the trip to Japan be removed from the consent agenda and taken at a later date. Um, so the, um, the consent agenda now will have approval of warrant 15147, dated 4-9-2015 in the amount of $518,380.22. Approval of minutes, regular meeting on April 9th, 2015, and the organizational meeting of April 9th. 2015, and approval of public hearing school choice, which will occur on Thursday, May 14th, 2015, at 6.30 p.m. So uh, moved. Moved by Mr. Thielman, seconded by? Second. Uh, Ms. Starks, uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That's a unanimous vote. Subcommittee and liaison reports. Um, uh, we'll go down the list and um, uh, special study group on superintendent evaluation, Mr. Hainer. Uh, it's not listed here, but this should be the technical second reading of uh, the questionnaire and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would move that we uh, accept that. Are we all familiar with what I'm talking about? The questionnaire going out for the oh, evaluation of the yeah. superintendent mm -hmm. yeah. and uh, the procedure and stuff like that. I need a second. Uh, uh, what? what, Mr. Uh, Mr. Hainer is moving okay. approval on a second reading of the questionnaire for oh, the superintendent's Oh, did anybody, did evaluation. you get any input, feedback? Really? I got nothing. Oh. The one that I just sent a couple of small things on, is that the yes. questionnaire? Yes, and, and, okay. and that, we, we made those adjustments at the, the last, prior to the last meeting, as far mm -hmm. as I know. Mm -hmm. well, I didn't make any changes, right? So I did. you, okay. Mm -hmm. I'm so not you're, on moving, that committee you're moving. You're uh, moving to accept it as it is, or you're moving I, to. I, I, sorry. I I accepted your input. I made the. They weren't major. They didn't no, no, change. No, they didn't change anything of substance. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I just put it in. Yeah. Like that. They uh, there were no substantive changes in the the thing. Mm -hmm. I, I as my wife hit me on the head. She said that's gram better grammar, on one of them, like that. Hmm. Uh, okay, Mr. moved oh. by Mr. Hainer, seconded by Mr. Pierce. Any discussion? Nope, no. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That's a unanimous vote. Thank you. Um, warrant committee. I signed the warrant, payroll warrants, everyone get, has gotten paid. Oh, good. I have not, I have not established any uh, meetings at this time. Mm -hmm. uh, just for clarification. Um, the superintendent evaluation mm -hmm. was a temporary committee. Mm -hmm. it, it is do I need to bring up something uh, in the spring? Uh, we, we have the calendar mm -hmm. uh, that we're going forward with it like that. Let me bring it the next meeting. Yeah, let's bring it the uh, next Thank meeting, you. and we can uh, so that we're all prepared to discuss yeah. it. Uh, policies and procedures, Mr. Pierce. We held a meeting on April 14th. We discussed policies relative to um, student uh, discipline and uh, parental leave and family medical leave. We'll be uh, meeting again on May 14th at 5.30 here to go over those same policies. There have been some changes uh, uh, from the lawyers uh, and from the administration. Uh, Dr. Allison Ampey is not here. Is there anybody from the budget committee who'd like to say anything on the budget subcommittee? Hearing none. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was well, just going to say we, we, we took input from uh, Ms. Dunn and uh, Ms. Johnson on the book uh, mm -hmm. going forward and stuff like that. They took some of our suggestions and mm -hmm. shared, with her, uh, shared with us that some of our suggestions weren't realistic and we all agreed. Mm -hmm. and we were, it was a positive, very positive meeting. Excellent. Uh, facilities. Uh, obviously we need a meeting. <laughs> mm -hmm. So we'll have one. I don't know when. Soon. 
uh, district <coughs> accountability curriculum instruction and assessment. Mr. Thielman. No report. Uh, community relations, Dr. Seuss. Uh, yes, we have a meeting coming up on Thursday the 7th, and it's uh, basically just to sort of brainstorm a little bit. We're not, you know, there's no mm -hmm. agenda item necessarily, but what do we want to accomplish in the coming year? Mm -hmm. What time? Uh, it is at 4, four o'clock. Thank you. So it's, it should uh, be sent out soon. We had a uh, trip yesterday to Day on the Hill. I know our student rep was there. She's smiling. She, I think she had a good time. Did you enjoy the She food? was fabulous, yeah, she was, by the way. Excellent. She did a great job of uh, talking to our reps and senators. Uh, let me uh, ask uh, Clara to yeah. just uh, tell us what your impressions of going to Day on the Hill were. Um, I definitely thought it was a very cool experience to have to see sort of the government and education in the government um, at work and it was very awesome to be able to talk to our representatives and our senators. Um, I definitely saw and heard a lot of we don't have as much money in our budget as we need to which mm -hmm. of course I've heard everywhere um, about education. Um, and I heard about a lot of issues that I hadn't heard about before and are definitely interesting to me. Um, so I would like to continue being a part of um, coming to these meetings and being able to speak out about things. Excellent. So thank you. Uh, Can I just Dr. say? Dr. Seuss. Oh, just um, some of the districts had a whole bunch of students. And last year we had none. This year we had one, which was fabulous. And as I said, she was incredibly articulate and you. You know, no fear at all and just saying what she needed to say to our legislators and advocating for the schools. Um, we would like to have more students. So yeah. I encourage uh, more students to oh, yeah. come forward next year. And we want we want to welcome you guys. And the food is fabulous. Yeah, yep. there, there will definitely, <laughs> so there will definitely be interest. Draw. Yeah. Mr. I would like to mention that uh, Clara uh, expressed herself extremely well mm -hmm. on uh, the issues of student anxiety mm -hmm. and uh, testing. Mm -hmm. uh, she, uh, she was not shy about that, and it was wonderful to hear it from a student. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Ms. Starks uh, organized a, a bunch of uh, issues that we discussed, and I wanted to thank her for uh, all the prep work that she did in terms of uh, helping us to make this successful. Cool. Yeah, I know. I felt like we were really on target mm -hmm. you know it was I thought that we really got our uh, thanks many thanks to Kiersey who did uh, mm -hmm. yeoman's work uh, kind of pulling all of her mm -hmm. um, issues with the budget and uh, you know the foundation budget into kind of a digestible piece for everybody so um, you know she did a lot of great work and uh, I just thought that everybody was great everybody kind mm -hmm. of came in we we were really good about targeting what we wanted mm -hmm. to say and kind of listening to each other as well as uh, you know, all making sure everybody had a voice, so that was great. We linked up to on the MASC listserv to the foundation budget articles that were written by um, Kersey and um, and right. and Linda, um, and uh, I got a lot of very positive feedback about the, the articles. That they were very well written, very clear, uh, uh, and uh, other communities were anxious to go and plug their numbers into into our work to duplicate that effort. Mr. Hainer, was your hand no, up? No, uh, Ms. Stocks covered it. Okay. I, I just want to make a plug for um, Kersey and uh, Linda Hansen's, um, Dr. Hansen and Linda Hansen's um, advocate articles, yes. um, which were also yep. really informative, and I urge you to go look for them in the records if you haven't Good seen them already. Mm -hmm. Any other members with announcements or um, uh, things to bring forward to the committee. Mr. Hainer. Tomorrow, uh, I got a semi corralled into, I'm going to be the keynote speaker to uh, today's students and tomorrow's uh, teachers, uh, those that are graduating. Uh, I'm a little trepidation, like my first day being the chair here. I'm nervous about it, but I'm excited about it, seeing future teachers. Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Seuss. Oh, I just wanted to mention that uh, Seuss, Odyssey Middle School is performing Seussical this weekend oh, cool. on Friday and Saturday. Um, yeah, um, oh, yes. Ms. Stark? I also want to remind people that the townwide cleanup is uh, the Saturday before Mother's Day. And if you ask me what better gift can we give Mother Nature, <laughs> what better Mother's Day gift can you give Mother Earth, then show up and pick up a bag of trash. Um, they are going to organize it uh, back behind in the big town lot. 
and uh, you can show up. They'll give you gloves and bags, and you can go off and do whatever area of town you want. Um, I think I'm probably going to be doing the Route 2 side of Spy Pond. Mm -hmm. So pick a place, show up, clean up. It'll be fun. And, and just a note, the Touchdown Club is having their annual, annual banquet on the 14th, and I know that the previous two chairs gave the gavel to their vice chair to make a quick run down the street to go and extend greetings and to congratulate uh, an organization that does a lot for our kids here in town so that uh, Dr. Seuss will be leading the meeting for uh, for a little while on, okay. on the next meeting. So okay, it doesn't I'm come a little as nervous, a surprise. but okay. <laughs> uh, not, nothing to be nervous about there, friendly. And, and I just want to extend my apologies to the rest of the committee um, on one issue is that uh, being a new chair, I don't think that the superintendent or I, and it's, it's my issue, not hers, are necessarily in sync, so the agenda came out later than I would have liked, and I take responsibility for that, and I'm going to try to come up with a way to uh, communicate with the superintendent, a little more timely matter. The vacation sort of got in the way, too, but uh, uh, it's my intent to get this thing out, uh, do, do, do a better job than I did this week. I think, Mr. Uh, Hainer. Dr. Seuss, at least you found out the former chair told me about two and a half hours. He said, oh, by the way, I'm going to be gone. So my anxiety was short <laughs> Well, we'll put something tricky on the agenda just for that spot. Uh, uh, <laughs> so, do you want to mention the, um, the vigil, candlelight vigil? Oh, yeah, we have a candlelight vigil uh, for the um, victims and survivors of the earthquake in, in, in Nepal. Uh, which will be in front of Town Hall 7 to 7.30 p.m. on Sunday, May 3rd. Bring your own candles. Uh, also, the Vito San Marco group is having a fundraiser this weekend, and also the couple, uh, next week they have a couple of dates where 15% of the check will be donated from Not Your Average Joe's, so if you're inclined to eat out, that's sort of a, a good way to throw a couple extra bucks in that pot as well. Uh, any other announcements before we have a motion to go to executive session? Um, did, did you take the, the Japan trip out of the front? Yes. Yeah, so we'll do that next time. Uh, we're going to move to executive session uh, to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with union and or non-union personnel or contract negotiations with union and or non-union in which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect and to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigation position of the public body, and the chair so declares. Uh, do I hear a motion? So moved. So moved. Uh, moved by Mr. Hainer, uh, seconded by Ms. Starks. We will have no plans to return to open session at the conclusion of the executive session. Roll call, Mr. Hainer. Aye. Mr. Pierce. Aye. Uh, Ms. Starks. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Aye. Dr. Seuss. Aye. Uh, and the chair votes aye. It is a unanimous vote, six to nothing, and we are in executive session. Okay.